Political body with the authority to investigate and indict wrongdoing by government agencies or officials. Notice it says investigate or indict. I have a letter here that I wrote to the head of the Investigations Bureau of the Virginia State Police, and on the website it says they initiate investigations requested by the governor the Attorney General, and grand juries. Grand juries means we the people, you and me. It's the lower house of the bicameral judiciary. Now, I discovered this by the grace of God on the 1st of January this year. And on the 21st of January, well, First of all, God's divine providence was a former Democrat Commonwealth attorney named Paul Thompson was arrested by federal authorities for evidence tampering and witness tampering. He's been doing that sort of thing for 17 years, but finally he was arrested, in part because we got a special prosecutor named to investigate him, which raised his profile last June 18th, about one year ago yesterday. And then the federal authorities started looking at him, and they arrested him on the 10th of June. Uh, January, I'm sorry, excuse me. On the 21st of January, I filed my first special grant petition for citizens' petition for special grand jury. The very same day, a corrupt judge in Winchester, Virginia, John Prosser, submitted an early retirement letter to the Chief Justice of Virginia because he knew that he was his corruption was going to be exposed by this grand jury. On the 15th of February. I went before that grand jury He did with, that to try and make it so the special grand jury would not vote to convene or to impanel a special grand jury. The regular grand jury has to vote a majority of the members to impanel a special grand jury, which then has the authority to investigate and indict government agencies or officials. Well, I asked him for a rehearing. I asked Judge Wetzel for a rehearing, and he denied me. So then I filed a petition for writ of mandamus to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Virginia. And then a few days later I filed a second citizen's petition for special grand jury. And I named Judge Wetzel, former Commonwealth Attorney Paul Thompson, retired Judge John Prosser, former Winchester Police Investigator David Sabonia, former Police Investigator uh, James Bayless, current Commonwealth Attorney Alex Iden, and both former and current Assistant Commonwealth Attorney Mark Abrams. And so, I have in front of me here an order from the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Virginia, Cynthia Kenser, dated the 19th of April Second. in this year, in the year of our Lord, 2011, that appoints a judge from outside the 26th Circuit to go into Winchester and preside over a grand jury hearing so that I can have some semblance of a level playing field so that the jury will vote to equip or impanel a special grand jury which then can call the Virginia State Police to assist them in investigation and indictment of government employees, government elected servants who are violating the rights of the citizens of Virginia and trampling on this Constitution of Virginia and this Constitution for the United States of America. Again, like the fourth branch of government, the grand jury is we the people reclaiming our government from those servants who have become tyrannical masters. Let us all do so. And General George Washington said to Light Horse Harry Lee on the 31st of October, 1786, Precedents are dangerous things. Let the reins of government be braced and held with a steady hand, and every violation of the Constitution be reprehended. If defective, let it be amended, but not suffered to be trampled upon while it has an existence. And sadly, in America today, and especially in Virginia, 
Our constitutions are being trampled by men and women in black robes. And it is our duty to God and country, it is our duty, we the people, to reclaim our nation under God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, don't let anybody tell you that you don't have a right to hold public officials accountable through the law because you do. The only problem is Judge Holland is denying access to the courts and she should be taken before the Justice Department. Nancy Dennis, Sheriff Anderson, they are all in violation of 18 U.S.C. 241 and 242. And any lawyer that's listening to me and you hear this, you, are, you have a duty and an obligation to report these crimes to the Justice Department. You have a duty. Frank V. Wells, 184-86. All of you lawyers who are officers of the court and you know that the people's right to the grand jury is being Shame blocked and denied, Shame. Shame. you have a duty. You have a duty to report it that's to right. the Justice Department. That's right. All of you sheriffs that know that the people's right to the grand jury is being blocked, you have a duty to report this crime Shame. to the Justice Department. Shame. That's you, Stephanie. You have a duty to report it to the Justice Department. And you can walk away, but you're on camera. And we see you and we know we told you. You, officer of the court, you know. You can walk away, but we got you on camera. Telling you the judge Colin is violating 18 U.S.C. 241 and 242. And we have the proof right here. He wasn't up trying to think it was wrong. What you do, he's going to have it. Which nobody did. Yes. Yes. is same as what is right in America today, the first three words of this Constitution. We, the people. That's what's wrong, and that's what's right. If we, the people, will read this Constitution and live it in our hearts, and live it in our walk, then we can reclaim the Republic that we founding fathers 
bequeath to America and the world. This is a priceless gift of God that we cannot allow to live, be lost here in America because if it's lost here, it's lost for mankind for generations, if not millennia. We have entrusted to us a great gift and we must learn this Constitution and fight for it. I want you all to remember that in, we know of Article 1 which talks about the legislative branch and Article 2 the executive branch, the presidency, but Article 3 is the judicial branch. And in that it says one Supreme Court and other such inferior courts. That doesn't mean that the quality of their service, it means their status. But notice when you look at that, it, that the word supreme is a lowercase word. Whereas in the Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson, when it talks about the supreme judge of the world, S is capitalized. So the supreme judge is superior to the Supreme Court. And it'd be wise if the justices learned that important fact. But remember I said, defending the dearest rights and liberties. The Bill of Rights is an enumeration of many rights, certainly not all of our rights, but some of the most important. We all know the First Amendment where it says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. I'm going to stop there and notice that the word is and, not the. That is to say that Congress shall not choose one religion over another, but it shall not have a law that discriminates against the creation and exercise of religion. And I suggest to you that any government that tells you that you can't pray in the name of Jesus Christ is violating your free exercise thereof and that's a violation of the First Amendment. Amen. Or abridging the freedom of speech. It's your freedom of speech to speak the name of Jesus Christ in a public place as I am doing or as any of you can do in any public place you choose. Or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble as we are doing here or to petition the government for address of grievances and that petition of the government can go to any of the branches it can go to the executive branch and you can have a pardon or a parole some sort of clemency from the executive branch and a pardon is like a veto to a bad judicial act like a veto is a bad the canceling of a bad legislative act so we need to look at more pardons where the justice system has failed. Think about it that if our justice system is 99 percent accurate and there's a hundred thousand men in jail, that means a thousand men are in jail that are innocent and the governor needs to have the courage to stand up and free give liberty back to those men who've had their liberty wrongly taken from them by the failure of the judicial system. Now notice also that in Article 3 we have the jury, but three of the ten amendments and also arguably the First Amendment where it says petition for the right uh, for redress of grievances. How do we petition? We petition to a special grand jury. And that's a right in Virginia that says the special grand jury is the one non-political body with the authority to investigate and indict government agencies or officials for wrongdoing. So you citizens, when your government is not doing your will, you have the ability to file a petition for special grand jury, to call those elected servants into the grand jury for investigation of their fraud, waste, and abuse. And so we will be washing a ton of waste, fraud, and abuse from the governments of America, and that will reduce our costs of government and thus our taxes. So I led one revolution against high taxes, and it's time to do it again. But where we do it is in the grand jury. That is 
the amendment number five. Amendment number six is the trial jury, jury for criminal trials. And amendment number seven is the trial jury for civil trials. Well, we have a plague in America of dividing families by divorce, the destructive force of divorce. And then we divide children so that they rarely ever see their father. And as the father of his country, I don't think that's good for the future of America. But we should make it so a jury decides what percentage of the child's time is to go with the father and what percentage to go with the mother. And then we will no longer have the situation where lawyers and judges are taking the wealth of the family to make those decisions because the jury will make that decision. So I just am wanting to tell you that one of our most important rights that we forget, everybody who's served on a jury, raise your hand. All right, look around. And I would guess that it's probably less than a quarter of the people here. That is one of the most special rights that we have under this republic is a grand jury, or a, uh, serving on a jury, and the grand jury is sometimes described as the fourth branch of government. It's how we can force the government, the elected servants, to do our will. And again, as I said to Bushrod Washington, that whenever our elected servants don't follow our will, we can and most certainly will remove them, and that we can do with the special grand jury. So I encourage you all to read this Constitution for the United States of America and read the Constitution of Virginia so that you'll know your rights, so that you can have the opportunity, remember in the preamble it says, for ourselves and for our posterity. We're living under this Constitution now, but if we don't learn it, if we don't live it, if we don't love it, if we don't preserve it, it won't be there for posterity. It won't be there for our children and our children's children's children. God bless you, and may America bless God. Thank you. They were eloquent, prolific, and they were successful. And they all testified to their trust in God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all of that courage would be tested as well as their faith. They weren't wild-eyed pirates. They were all very, very successful. Men of means, educated, wealthy by the standards of the day and even today. 24 of the 56 were lawyers and jurists. 11 were successful merchants and traders. Nine, like Jefferson, were successful farmers, just like this farm right here in Virginia. But all but eight were born here in the colonies, as they were called then. Of those born overseas, three were from Ireland, two hailed from Scotland, the other three from England itself. Nine of them would die before the war for independence was over. Five were captured by the British and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes looted and destroyed. Neither Judge Morton from Ridgely, Pennsylvania, or Button Gwinnett, the signer from Georgia, would ever see the first anniversary of their signatures. They were both dead before the first year was out. Before the war was over, they'd be joined by seven of their colleagues. Philip Livingston, the merchant from Albany, New York, who'd helped Jefferson draft the original document, was dead before the second anniversary. Thomas Lynch, a farmer from South Carolina, would die of wounds inflicted in a naval engagement in 1779, making him the only signer of the Declaration to die in battle at sea. Carter Braxton, a wealthy farmer and trader from Virginia, saw his armada of trading vessels swept from the oceans. To pay all of his debts, he sold all that he owned and died in rags in 1797. Thomas McKeon, born in Pennsylvania, was a lawyer, signer from Delaware, the British forced him to flee with his family five times during the war. He served without pay as a member of the Continental Congress, his family impoverished and in hiding. When he died in 1817 after the second war with England, his sons had to tape up, take up a collection from their neighbors to pay for his funeral. Thomas Nelson of Yorktown, Virginia, 
The final engagement of that long war borrowed two million dollars on nothing more than his own signature because people trusted him to provision the French fleet that eventually came to our aid in that final battle. After the war, he liquidated his entire estate to pay back the money that he'd borrowed because the Congress, ah yes, the Congress, I know them well, the Congress refused to reimburse him. He died penniless in 1789 and was buried in an unmarked grave. John Hart, a Yankee farmer from Connecticut, moved to plant crops in what he considered to be the more fertile soil of New Jersey, was driven from the sickbed of his wife by a British patrol sent to hunt him down. For more than a year he was on the run, living in what he could hunt, at times hiding in a cave in the forest. Learning that his beloved wife was failing, he took the terrible chance of returning home to find his wife had already died and his children were gone. He died a few weeks later on May 11, 1779, of what some said to be exhaustion and a broken heart. John Hancock, for those of you who have seen that document preserved at the National Archives, John Hancock signed so big because he wanted King George to be able to see it without his spectacles. On the occasion when he stood as watched his beloved Boston being shelled by the American forces that had dragged the cannons all the way over from Fort Ticonderoga in the middle of winter, he saw the fire sweeping toward his home. And as he did so, he is reported to have said, burn Boston, though it makes John Hancock a beggar. Burn, if it will deny the British this city. And it did. Like the other 55 who signed the document, John Hancock kept his pledge. What a remarkable testament to the faith and courage and their belief in the power of prayer. They had begged God's blessing when they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor never to recant and to stay the course. All 56 were indicted, declared to be criminals, and tried in absentia in British courts for treason. All were convicted, condemned, hunted, and hounded. Their lives and their families and all that they had were in grave jeopardy, but not one man broke his pledge. They inspired a new nation that was born out of a wilderness, a nation that is, as the prayer was said before, blessed with bounty beyond measure. This is another such time. It calls for courage. It calls for perseverance and tenacity. And it calls for belief and faith that the God Almighty that blessed this nation so powerfully will not abandon us if we simply turn to Him. Just like the framers who gathered to look at that document 235 years ago today and voted unanimously two days later to withdraw from the British Empire, to declare independence. This is a nation that truly is the land of the free because it's the home of the brave and those of us who know the power of prayer will not abandon it. God bless you and thank you for being here to celebrate America's 235th anniversary.